On August 6, 1945, the United States warplane, the Enola Gay, dropped the world's first atomic bomb on the city of Hiroshima, Japan. At the trigger that historic day was bombardier Thomas Farabee. Farabee grew up on a farm near Moxville, North Carolina, playing multiple sports through high school. He attended Lees McRae College in Banner Elk before enlisting in the Army. A knee injury kept Farabee out of the infantry, but the Army Air Corps accepted him into their program instead. Back in those days, if you got 10 missions in, why, you were really lucky. Because if you were, without being shot down and being either dead or a prisoner of war. And so we had, Tom and I had both just said, hey, we're not going to make this war. So from that on, it was easy. Well, not easy, but easier. Theodore Dutch Van Kirk was a navigator on the Enola Gay. He was also a good friend of Farabee's. The two men were hand-selected by Captain Paul Tibbetts to crew the famed airplane. Uh, between Paul and Tom and I, we were very, very close because we had flown most of our missions over in England and Africa together. And then we, Paul got selected for this group of the Atomic Group, and he picked us for group navigator and group bombardier so we could continue flying together almost all during the war. So we were very close to each other. And Tom Farabee is my best friend from the time I met Tom in the nose of a B-17 in Sarasota, Florida in 1942. And uh, we called, both called up the nose. He was a bombardier and I was a navigator. And that's how we introduced ourselves. And that was the beginning of a, a friendship that lasted until he died. After the war, Farabee stayed in the Air Force until his retirement in 1970. He then moved to Orlando, Florida and became a real estate agent. Still, the men from the Enola Gay kept in touch and enjoyed spending time together after the war. He was a man's man, let's put it that way. He's the kind of guy you want to sit down. You know, I can often think back to uh, Tom Ferby, Kermit Behan, uh, Jim Van Pelt and I going out to dinner with them or just having a meal with them or just having a beer with them in the officers club. It was always an experience. You, you never knew what you were going to argue about. But something, I'll tell you that right now. I thought, always thought of it as, as very similar to a brother-brother uh, relationship that uh, they were very close, and, and um, it was like family. Marianne Farabee is Colonel Farabee's widow. The couple was married for 19 years. Colonel Farabee would take his wife to functions honoring the famous flight crew, but in private, he didn't try to stand out, according to his wife. He was a very special man, um, very family-oriented, uh, wonderful husband. <laughs> Uh, I had to remind myself that he was a uh, World War II hero wh when we would appear at events and, and uh, he received all the attention that he did, but day by day uh, he was my husband and, and someone very special that I cared for and loved. And Ms. Farabee says her husband did have friends that didn't survive, but he tried to only remember the positive times of war. Uh, he talked about the, the good times and, and the um, um, experiences that he had. He didn't dwell on, on the, uh, the, the bad times, you might say, the, the uh, friends that were lost and uh, things of that type. He, he concentrated on on the positives. Tom Farabee died March 16th of 2000 in Florida, complications from ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. He's buried here in his hometown of Moxville, surrounded by other family members. Farabee was 81. Some of Farabee's memorabilia from the Enola Gay and the rest of his career have been donated to the North Carolina Museum of History in Raleigh. Ms. Farabee, Van Kirk, and other friends and family members celebrated the opening of the exhibit in July 2007. Van Kirk says dropping the bomb preserved the freedoms we still enjoy today, but didn't truly bring the world into the nuclear age. Well, the war essentially saved our way of life and everything else as compared to Hitler's or Stalin's or some other way of life and everything of that type. You know, it didn't seem that important back in those days, but in retrospect, why I think it proved to be that way. You know, we had the Cold War for a long time thereafter. And uh, uh, everybody will, will look at us and, say, and blame us. You say, you, you dropped the bomb, and therefore you inaugurated the atomic age. That's a lot baloney. The atomic age was born the day they split the atom. 
in Europe and everything of that type. Not when we dropped the first bomb.